our, our speaker today is Dr. Ramona Boat. Um, so Ramona and I have, are working together right now, actually, on some of the work that she's going to be presenting to you right here. Um, so Ramona is a staff scientist at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. She's in the Physics and Life Sciences Directorate, which was the same place that I came from, and also an adjunct professor at UC Davis. Um, she got her AS in engineering from Kaskaskia? Kaskaskia. Okay. Um, and then got her BA in physics from, um, from Illinois Urbana Champaign, and her MS, and her PhD at Stony Brook. So Ramona's background is in what I consider to be intermediate energy or even kind of high energy physics. But this shows the degree. Yes. What I would consider. <laughs> yeah. It's in, so it's so she is a fellow of the American Physical Society in the group for hadronic physics. I don't even think about hadrons, I just live with them. Um, Ramona has got an incredibly broad array of talents because she moved from that and has now been bringing some of those computational um, and modeling talents to addressing something that's at the heart of what all of us care about here in this department, which is fission, okay, the ultimate energy source, and it's what keeps us in beer and pizza. Um, so Ramona is going to tell us today about um, the title. It's a, it's, a, it's a remarkably unremarkable title. But it's about an extremely important topic. It's detailed modeling of fission and the work that she's been doing on this um, for, for the last several years. And so with that, I'll say for Mona, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you for that um, interesting introduction. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't say that, that I, I would consider high energy heavy ion collisions as uh, intermediate energy. I think it's Unless you're talking about cosmology. All right, so, um, so you all know about fission, so I don't have to go into too much detail, but I just want to mention that we're talking about actinides and more massive elements, so um, this is an old periodic table. We haven't got neonium, moscovium, tennessine, and, and oganesson um, on the chart yet, but they are <coughs> named, and, and some of them were uh, discovered with a collaboration between Livermore and, and Dubna, which is very cool. Um, and then over here on the chart of the nucleides, we're talking about this region near the top. And to get to the island of stability, we're up there with the uh, proton number, but we need to get heavier into neutron number. Um, so I'm going to first talk about what we know about fission data. Uh, which turns out to be probably a lot less than, than all of you would imagine because fission is well known, right? You know everything about it. No, no. forget about that right now. Um, I have a code uh, with Jeroen Randrup, who's sitting in the uh, middle of the second row with people. Um, and I'm going to go through the, the physics of the code as an example of a detailed model of fission. And then I'll say a little bit about comparison of, of our results with some other fission models that are on the market. And then um, we're going to talk about correlated observables, um, which are very interesting for applications and keep us in, in money through um, non-proliferation. So why do we want to make a detailed model of fission in the first place? I mean, in a, in a reactor or in a bomb, this thing blows up, all you need to do is make sure you have something that, that gives you more neutrons out than, than you come in with. And if there's not high enough density, the chain reaction happens and boom. Or not, depending on whether you have a moderator. Um, so you don't need to understand the details of, of fission for, for that. Um, but if you're looking for say something that, that somebody's trying to smuggle in or, or um, you want to try to distinguish one material from another, um, you want to look for some kind of a more unique signature and because that's a much smaller system, then, then the details matter. Like momentum and energy conservation, they matter. And that's what you can get very far with energy and momentum conservation. So what you want is a real complete um, fission model that can track the particles emitted and, um, and model all kinds of, of signatures. So um, basically, you know, the, from the 
simplest thing, we're starting um, from after assuming binary fission, we have an initial hot fragment that emits neutrons statistically, then photons statistically, and then um, discrete lines. So it's, it's getting rid of its excitation energy in, in this fashion. And how that happens <coughs> determines all of the neutron observables that, that we see. Um, so now I'll get straight into it. So what we, um, what we have um, for inputs in most of these models are the fission yields and the uh, total kinetic energy. Um, so there are certain characteristics you can look at in, in general over here. These are plutonium isotopes at different energies. So it's called thermal, fast, which is about an in incoming neutron with about 1 MeV, and then around 14 MeV, this is high energy, and um, compiled the yields for plutonium-238 up to 242. And they look all very, very similar. Um, and you, you see, a, a say, a, a dip um, around the, the center, so it's asymmetric fission. And as you go higher in energy, that dip fills in. And these, these wings out <coughs> here um, get broader. So you can reach um, a larger mass split in, in, this, in that high energy case. So this is for, for one element. On the right here, um, I have different elements from um, from, the, from thorium to um, californium, and what you see in here is that the uh, the dip at the, uh, in the center moves to the to the left towards lighter fragments, and the peak uh, for the light fragment also moves to the left, actually quite quite strongly, um, but you have a a fixed point here for the heavy fragment, and this is because you're near a closed nuclear shell with um, um, A equals around 132 for um, closed proton shell and closed neutron shell. And, and so um, that you're always going to have a, a peak near there, and everything else can, can move. Um, now, the fission product yields is a function of charge, this is fragment mass on the other side, actually I should say product in some sense, because once once you have decision, you have pro uh, fragments, and then there's prompt emission. And then after that, what you measure in your detector is, um, is the product. It's after the prompt emission. And then there's also delayed um, emission that can happen much later, but everything that happens right away, it happens very fast. And, and so you don't, the fragment can't reach the, the detector before it emits anything. So you always have to sort of do some backtracking. Um, so we have fission yields <coughs> as a function of, of charge as well. And um, these, these uh, lines are model calculations by um, Randrup and, uh, and Peter Muller in Los Alamos. And they've been refined since then, but given these kinds of results, we hope that we could actually model the yields and, and do something useful with, with that. Um, now to the total kinetic energy. This is something else that we need to know about um, to, to do our, our calculations. Um, and most of the energy in fission goes into the, the motion away from each other of, of, the, of the two products. And, um, What's left over is the excitation energy, and that determines everything for for the uh, neutrons and photons and whatever else gets emitted that you see. Um, but the kinetic energy, by far, is the is the bulk of it. And over here on the left hand side, you see the um, total kinetic energy for the fragments as a function of incident neutron energy. So it's going down um, rather slowly. Um, with the uh, incident neutron energy, this is from zero to 10 MeV. And then down here, you see the same thing for the products. So you notice that the zero energy is a little bit lower, of course, um, because you have emitted some, some neutrons at least, and that the slope is, is slightly steeper. Um, and then over here on the right, you see the kinetic energy is a function of the fragment mass. So this is the total kinetic energy, so it's the sum of the two fragments over here, and, and there's a peak at, again, around 132, and 
if you would actually normalize these all to the same point, then you see they lie almost exactly on top of each other. Uh, there are some differences down here below 132, but above it's a fairly straightforward and similar trend. And that's even true for, um, for different energies above, above thermal. Um, and then down here, this is the single fragment kinetic energy. And you can see there's a sort of a plateau from around um, the, the symmetric um, mass and then up to around 132. And then it, and then it drops. So that's the part that's responsible for the drop above 132. Okay, so now I want to go to um, the output, um, the emitted particles. So these are neutron multiplicity distributions. Um, and so you can see here there's data, and then there's this uh, red curve, which is a Poisson distribution. And it's the first thing you notice is that typically it's not Poisson-like at all, and that's because you don't just have you don't just have the uh, kinetic energy of the neutron that's being carried away, but there's a separation energy that, that's required for the uh, the neutrons to be emitted also, and that when that's taken into account, then then you have something that's more peaked than a Poisson. And um, here is the average neutron multiplicity. Um, as a function of the incident neutron energy. So if you take the average of this distribution uh, for a thermal, then you'll find that over here, at the, basically the zero point on, on this curve. And there are some curves that have more than, say, two points at zero and 20. Um, and uh, these are basically evaluated data sets. I've taken this from the end up um, compilation, and so they they consider these to be evaluated points. That means that they're they consider them to be worth something. There's at least been one measurement. Um, so I I think it was Morgan White who said there's um, one data set. We don't know if it's right. If there's two, it's pretty good. If there's more or if there's none, you get to make it up. And you get a very good example of that in this plot because. A lot of that data is made up. Um, okay, so now uh, the, new, the prompt vision neutron spectrum is very important. Um, it's logarithmically falling, and to make it easier to see how it actually looks compared to some kind of model calculation, um, people often plot the, the data relative to a Maxwell distribution that goes, which is exponential in energy. And then they take um, this T, uh, it's usually this temperature is taking to be about 1.42 MeV. And if, if it was a perfect Maxwellian, then this ratio would be one. Um, it's not. Um, this is thermal neutrons on plutonium-239. The data is basically all over the place, um, but Generally, you see it's slightly less than, than one uh, for low um, outgoing neutron energies, and maybe a little bit above around the mean. This is around the mean neutron energy, and then it's decreasing uh, relative to the Maxwellian um, for higher energies. This is uh, for uranium-235 plus neutron for four different energies. And there's this funky uh, kink up here um, which is probably due to pre-equilibrium emission, which I'll explain in a, in a few minutes. If you have any questions, you can just ask at any time. Um, okay, so now uh, I mentioned neutrons already, but there are also photons, which I just basically mentioned briefly, but haven't shown any data yet. Um, now here, I'm comparing uh, neutron and photon dependence on fragment mass. And this is uh, what's known as the nuclear sawtooth. And it's because you could say there's a, there's a sharp spike, and then a drop, and then another sharp spike. And how sharp that tooth is depends on how large the, uh, the nucleus is that's fissioning. So um, uranium-235, the, the peak is a little bit uh, 
near, say, 110, but for um, California, it's around 120 or so. And then you see a sharp drop, um, the sharpest for California, and then um, sort of more relaxed decrease for, for uranium uh, around A equals 132, so a doubly closed shell. And then you see an increase again. And the reason why is because once you have a doubly closed shell, you have a very spherical nucleus, and it doesn't doesn't really want to get excited. It doesn't need to be excited. And so it, it's very hard to get neutron emission from that, from that closed shell fragment. And then as you go up in, in fragment mass, then that you, you tend to have more deformation and more neutrons emitted. Uh, over here on the right, I've compared the um, um, nu of A as a function of, uh, well, nu as a function of A, to the total energy emitted by in photons that's divided by some number just to, to put it on the same plot. And the best comparison is here for, for California. This data by Nardi is from the early 70s, and it's actually fairly flat as a function of A but it does seem to have a slightly higher value around the same place as the peak for neutron emission, and then maybe yeah, some hint of a, of a dip, but it's a lot less clear. Um, some people take this as, as gospel and say that, that they go exactly lockstep together, but I wouldn't count on it. I would say it would be better to have more, more measurements uh, and more recent measurements. And the same thing is shown here for uranium-235, but the uncertainties are so large that even though the, the trend is very similar, I don't want to jump to any conclusions by, by saying, yes, this shows that it's sausage-like. There seems to be a, a, a lack of solid disks in the downward portion, and the, the, uh, between 110 and 130. Over here? Yeah. What, what happened to them? I mean, don't, don't you have... Uh, don't I have them? I mean, I mean if, they, I, if, they, I, if they, I had them, I'd they, plot them. Didn't they find <laughs> any, uh, any neutrons from the, 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 those... Uh, those would be um, photons. Could it maybe be a matter of statistics? This is just yeah. you don't get any fragments, right? This is near yeah. symmetry. Yeah, if you, yeah, exactly. If you look at the, at the plot here again, um, those those are coming from the from the place where you have the dip. In, so no, no in fragments the, in the yield. So fragment no yields. Are, you don't. Yeah, I mean some of, some of these. If, if you plot them on a linear scale, you, you um, they look like zero, and there is no. I mean, some of the data just no. seems to be zero. They just didn't detect any in a particular set sometimes. Okay, so. Um, now, moving on to the photon multiplicity distribution, um, there are a couple of measurements that I've shown here. This is the distribution um, from California spontaneous fission, uh, that, and you see it's more Poisson-like for, for photons than for neutrons because there's no separation energy. <coughs> it's the kinetic energy that's taken away. And then over here on the right, this is the photon multiplicity distribution for two neutrons emitted from barium versus four neutrons emitted. And the, the or open circles are with four neutrons emitted and the, <coughs> the solid ones are for two neutrons emitted. And if you think about it, you expect more or less that if you have a higher neutron multiplicity, you, you should have a, a lower photon multiplicity, just by conservation. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's very difficult to say um, what what is the trend here because the uh, uncertainties are rather large and just from statistics uh, it would be very <coughs> nice if we could make more measurements like this and be able to count for a long longer time maybe um, so you should know right? yeah we could do it better now yeah that was our cute experiment right with, with Darren Google the one on the right. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah, this is the Liberace. So people in the room are, have worked on this. Are these gated on a particular fragment? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. so there's 108 gotcha. molybdenum, and then 
on barium 142 and 144. So it's, it's a little small, it's hard to read. Okay, so these are some basic sets of data that you can use for inputs and you can use to, for comparison when you make your model. Um, but I have to say, I mean, as you can see from the trend of the neutron multiplicity as a function of energy, that the data aren't always very good. And they're not always sufficient for, for making a, a good model. Um, a lot of fission experiments have focused on certain type of observable, um, such as the fission product yields to very high accuracy for certain actinides, certain Uranium-235, plutonium-239, no big surprise why. Um, but that means that a lot of other isotopes aren't measured very well or even measured at all. And a lot of what you find then in NF, because beta abhors a vacuum, um, and Galvin Vision Transport Code will go off the rails because there isn't any data. So there's model data that's put in there uh, that basically has no compare, you know, no basis in reality other than, than somebody's average vision model. Um, so the data that I've showed before, like the this um, sawtooth oops, over here, this is usually only measured for thermal neutrons and it, it would be good to see it measured for other energies as well. There are a couple of Actinides where it's been measured for maybe two different energies, I think Neptunium-237 is one, but there are very few. And um, so a code like, like ours can, can try and, and tell you where, where the data are most insufficient or you know, why you need to measure this because you really want to know that. Um, but there are some perils on, on our side comparing uh, models to, to data because you know we're we're making certain assumptions based on what we think the data really are, and they may not be that. Um, so, actually, you know, in, in my mind, if you can average neutron multiplicity, sort of experiments are very easy because you just have to count the neutrons that come out. Maybe you shake your head, I don't know. Um, but uh, basically, they're, they're counting experiments and they're fine for average quantities. But if you want to measure, say, the sawtooth, then you need not just the neutrons, but you need the fragments or the products and then back out uh, to the fragments. And so that's, that's already the peril. You, you measure the, the product, but, but we want the fragments. Um, so you have to have, there's already some reverse analysis done on, on a lot of the plots that I showed just before. So now going to fission models. I mean, up until the early 2000s, there were just deterministic models that don't provide any information beyond the average, I mean, just based on the average. And there's no real theory of fission. I mean, a lot of people are interested in making such a theory of fission, but it's, it's very, very difficult. You need lots of big computers if you want to start from the nuclear wave function with perfect anti-symmetrization. And real success is still a long way away. Um, now, as far as on our end, with a more detailed model, but going to something that, that people think they know really, really, really well, and, and trying to, to make our code come out to, to match that, exactly, match the expectations, I should say exactly. That's also really hard because they, they claim that, that the average neutron multiplicity for some things is very well known to like around 0.1%. And Monte Carlo is never going to give you 0.1%. I mean, infinite statistics aside, no. It's just not going to do that because there are, t there are too many uncertainties. Um, so, but there are, there are three things that application codes really care about. I mean, absolutely do or die. Um, one is the average neutron multiplicity, which you know you can sort of fit given anything else. The fission cross-section, which we're not worried about because 
you know, we, our code fissions, that's all we care about. Um, so we're not starting with a cross section. And then the prompt fission neutron spectrum. And um, we tried to make an evaluation of, of that. And it's, it's very, very difficult, especially if you're trying to fit the parameters to the data because the data, as you saw um, back, whoops, going around my own time, are all over the place. I mean, you can throw out different different sets, and there are new measurements ongoing right now. And you know, if they if they come out and say you know, it's too high here, I mean, it's higher than these or lower than these, or it's you know right on, you know, which one you you know you have to decide which one you're going to believe. Hopefully, the, the most recent data are actually the best data. Okay. Um, so the prompt vision neutron spectrum evaluation is based on the Los Alamos model, which I'll go to the next slide and ex explain. Um, but a lot of effort in the last few years has been going into measuring the prompt vision neutron spectrum for uranium-235 and plutonium-239 at different energies really, really well. They're working on that at Lance right now. Um, so the deterministic models are really used still, and it's probably going to be a while before a code like ours can, can get into an evaluation in, in a way that, that these people will be satisfied with. But meanwhile, it's very hard to, to compare because things like criticality, when you, when you put in a new distribution, the prompt vision neutron spectrum, for example, it messes everything else up. And, and there's a lot of uncertainties that aren't really there are a lot of uh, juggled uncertainties to make it all work. And if you actually have a better physics model, because it still breaks everything, people don't necessarily want to use it. Because it's all about getting the average right. Okay. So um, the Los Alamos model by Madlin and Nix in the early 80s was deterministic. And it's sort of the gold standard. Everybody still uses it. And it assumes a most probable average fragment, most probable average separation energy, um, average vision Q value. Um, they assume a, a spectral shape with a maximum temperature that is triangular. And then you get, you get a prompt um, spectrum out like this. And um, it works really, really well. There are a number of deterministic variants of this model. Um, say Annabella Tudora and her collaborators, they do something called the point by point model where they, they go a little bit away from the a little bit further away from the average and they do this uh, Los Alamos model for every single different fragment, uh, making lots of assumptions and basically putting in what you want to get out. You kind of have to do for for this kind of a thing. That's real model. Yes, it is. <laughs> Um, but you know, we, we want to do something that's really more physics-based, which is um, and, and try and get closer to the same level of accuracy, which is like stepping off a cliff and hoping that, that there's a actually a plank there that you can't see, like an Indiana Jones. It'll get you to the other side. Um, so basically, what I've been talking about um, with the deterministic models, Los Alamos model, whatever, is a black box. You don't know anything about how these, this neutron relates to that neutron or that photon or anything else. Um, so when, you, when you're sampling from a spectrum and you want to get the energy of the, say, fourth neutron out, then it's still the same distribution you're sampling from even after it's had three neutrons removed from it. So you know, there's no energy and momentum conservation at all. You know, it works on average, so, you know. And who cares because, you know, in, in average, you know, in a reactor or a, a bomb, it's all that matters on average. But if you really want to know something about how these things are correlated, you have to go into more detail and follow the, the fragments, the neutrons, and the photons, and then you get all the correlations automatically included, and you'll see that things change. The spectrum changes when you take neutrons out of it. 
So um, we have this um, our code Briya, which uh, we we like the name, so we came up with an acronym to go with it. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a lot better than Bidget, which is what somebody else proposed. <laughs> Vision widget. This is this is much better, and I get a Nordic goddess to go with it. So, um, vision Freya stands for Vision Reaction Event Yield Algorithm, and it was developed uh, in collaboration with with Ram Randrup, who's Nordic. So that makes great sense. They want a Nordic goddess. Um, this is more Renaissance than than uh, Nordic, but Freya is supposed to ride in a chariot pulled by cats, <laughs> and. Um, one of my friends in, you know, in our younger days used to say, getting theorists to collaborate was like hurting cats. So um, we, yeah, we make it work. We get it done. But it is true. It's not always easy to get theorists to collaborate. Um, experimentalists are sort of forced. So anyway, there we have a, a bunch of papers. Um, we have a book chapter. And we have a, a, a user manual and a published version of Raya, that, and uh, I'll say a little bit more about that at the very end. So now I'm going to uh, probably spend a whole lot of time on the first part. Well, so um, I will go through the physics of Raya, but I won't go through in great detail. The slides will be posted somewhere, we will know, oh, sure. and um, you can look through at your leisure and contact me if you have questions. So the idea uh, we got because of high energy heavy ion physics, you know, and, and we study these, we model these large collisions of, of nuclei, and you follow everything in the event. And when you come to um, the idea of you know, fission, you, you, have, you have an event where you have very relatively few things to follow, but why were people not doing that? I mean, make an event generator. And so that's, that's where we came up with the idea of making fast generation of large samples of complete events. Um, so we get the full kinematic information and all the final particles, the product nuclei, uh, the neutrons, and the photons. And so we could extract any observable. We could include fluctuations and correlations. And we could take account um, cuts and acceptances for detectors and um, so like the, the energy thresholds, um, phase space uh, reduction by detector acceptance or whatever you want to call it. And since it's fast, you can incorporate it into a transport code, uh, a bigger transport code without actually you know, any real appreciable slowing, which is important. So the idea is to be able to, say, use it for modeling the detector, understanding what you're seeing out of your detector, and also trying to, to use it to ana analyze your results. Um, that's the ideal thing, um, because we don't have everything perfect yet. I mean, we're still working on making things better, but uh, we want to, you know, that, that's our ultimate goal. So uh, as far as the fragment mass and charge distributions, um, we, we can either take you know, the vision yields as we get them from data, if the data is good enough, or if there is no other source. Um, and it's spontaneous vision, that's basically what we do. But when it comes to neutron-induced vision, and we want to go from thermal energies all the way up to 20 MeV or so, then we have to make some kind of energy-dependent model of the yields. And, and so um, that's what we do. And um, it's called five Gaussians because there are two uh, sets of asymmetric Gaussians with different different displacements from the center, and then we have a, 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 a symmetric in the middle, a symmetric yield in the middle that increases the um, um, the normalization increases with uh, with energy. Um, and so when we when we start off with these fragments, um, and they're okay. We're, and back up a little bit. We start off with the nucleus, and depending on what happens, you know, it can fission or not. Um, and we're always assuming fission. If it doesn't want to fission, then the event gets thrown away and we start over. Um, 
but there's this pre-equilibrium neutron emission that I, I mentioned because it, it actually does have an endpoint in energy. Um, and that is based on the energy that the neutron came in with. So if you have the neutron coming in on a, a, a big actinide, it can be absorbed and make a compound, or it can be briefly attached and then disassociate itself again. And that's called pre-equilibrium emission because it doesn't actually equilibrate and, and make the compound. And, and when you do that, then say if you come in with a 14 MeV um, neutron, then you're going to have maximum energy of that neutron coming out of 14 MeV. That's why there's, a, there's an endpoint right there. Um, so that's one thing that can happen, but it can still fission after the neutron has been released. So you have to take that into account in, in the modeling, and it's mostly important at high energies, and it doesn't really contribute a whole lot to the, uh, to the total neutron multiplicity because even at 20 MeV, it's, it's less than, um, it's a very small effect on the total multiplicity, less than one neutron. So do we also have something called multi-chance fission. <coughs> so if you proceed to fission immediately, uh, once, once the compound starts vibrating and the shape changing and, and moving the fragments apart to form the neck, and the neck snaps without any neutron emission previous, that's called first chance fission, and that's what happens most of the time at, at low energies. And as you go up in energy, uh, you have the possibility to emit a neutron and still have enough energy left to fission. And you can emit a neutron and then there's no, the event fizzles instead of fissions, and no, no fission occurs. And the higher up in energy you go, the more possibility you have for emitting one or more neutrons and still having enough energy left to fission. And this actually, you, know, you have to be careful because this also changes the, the yield because you know, the, when the fission occurs, it's not the same compound as you start with and it's also not the same energy because it's already lost um, the, uh, the kinetic energy of that neutron out and its separation energy. So we have to take that into account. Um, and then with the vision fragment kinetic energies, it's always good to have a um, parameter to try to get that all-important neutron multiplicity correct. So we have this um, shift in the total kinetic energy. And it does, it's, say, on the order, of, it's less than one MeV, so it's not very, very, very good. And within the uncertainties that aren't shown in the data. There's, there's you know, another pro problem with some of these data is that there's hardly ever an error bars on it. So it's really very difficult to take into account how well it's actually known. Um, these, these magenta lines here aren't actually error bars, they're supposed to be the full width half max, so depending on the, on the Z that goes with that A. Um, so if you're not worrying about rotation, just to start with, you can get the fragment excitation energies by um, reducing the, the fission Q value by the um, total kinetic energy, and then what's left over gets into the um, excitation energy that's available for neutron and photon emission. Um, you can start out with a common temperature based on a level density parameter where we have the E0 here in the denominator as, a, as an adjustable parameter. And then we have another adjustment here that um, tends to give more excitation energy to the light fragment because you tend to get more neutrons from the light fragment. Um, and then we have a thermal variant um, that's, that also has a parameter here, the C. And um, then when, when we include the thermal fluctuation, this <coughs> delta um, E, then we have to take it away from the uh, total kinetic energy because we want to, of course, maintain total energy conservation. Um, and then you know, we could go from, from there. But because then when the neutron comes in, or um, even when you're starting off from, from spontaneous fission, like, um, you can have, I mean, the fragments will most likely be rotating as well as, as moving um, linearly away 
from the source of the decision. Um, so actually, with the neutron coming in, you can actually start the fragment rotating, the, sorry, the nucleus rotating before it fissions. And, and so then you don't only really have the um, initial statistical excitation, but you have a rotational energy. And we can treat that. Um, there's typically a number of um, modes. First is rigid rotation. I mean, it's just you're, the whole thing can rotate around a, a single axis. And then you have wriggling modes, which are like this. And then um, bending modes, which are one way or the other. Um, and then we're, we're ignoring the, the tilting and, and twisting modes, which just means they're going around the axis instead of um, rotating with respect to each other, which is what these uh, wriggling and bending fluctuations are doing. So we can include those. Um, we start out with the rigid rotation, which, which gives the um, axis of rotations, and, and then we can include those fluctuations which give a change in the relative orbital angular momentum. And so you have a total rotational energy for the entire system, including not just the rigid rotator, but also those fluctuations. And then you readjust the fragment excitation energies based on the fact that you have to re remove the uh, rotational energy for the uh, um, to get the actual available statistical um, excitation energy. And then you do the whole thing as before. And so these rotations are going to be most important for photon emission. Emitting neutrons doesn't really change the angular momentum of the fragments at all. But it's important for um, the, uh, the photon emission. And I should have mentioned here that we have this other parameter, this spin temperature, and we can adjust this relative to the decision temperature, which basically sets the level of, of the nuclear spin. So um, then we can calculate the exit trajectory and the neutron evaporation from the rotating fragment so we can conserve linear and angular momentum. So now uh, we evaporate neutrons from this energy spectrum, this Weisskopf Ewing spectrum, and um, then we also have a boost from the emitter frame to the lab frame because in the, uh, in the rest frame of the fragment, the, the uh, neutrons are emitted basically isotropically, but then you're not looking at the, uh, you're not measuring the, the rest frame of the fragment, you're measuring in the lab frame. So this boost means that the neutrons that are emitted with the frag uh, from a specific fragment are following in the direction of that fragment. Um, this is not necessarily the case for photons because they move with speed of light and don't really uh, get subjected to a boost. But um, you, you evaporate neutrons basically until you get an excitation energy below this neutron separation energy, and then you get rid of the rest of the excitation energy by sequential photon emission. And, and generally, the energy is high enough at the beginning that you emit gammas statistically also. But then um, as you go down, you can start connecting to uh, ripple um, levels in a, that are tabulated. Um, but if we don't have the tabulated levels for a specific fragment, then um, we use this ERAS line. But the point is that you start from a hot, rotating, excited fragment, and you get down to the ground state where it's cold, cold and dark, so to speak. Um, so I've been giving you some of the external parameters that can be adjusted to the data. I mentioned the shift in the total kinetic energy, this asymptotic level density parameter, um, the excitation energy balance between the light and heavy fragment. If you're really interested only in specific cases you, where there's data, you can tune that X and make it A-dependent. But because we want to try to be more um, general, uh, we've, we've left that value as a single value. Um, you have the width of the thermal fluctuation, this multiplier of the decision um, temperature. And then we could adjust the uh, point where the neutron emission ceases and photon emission takes over to be something other than the uh, separation energy, but this, this is not really uh, very important. 
parameter, and we don't really like to change the <coughs> um, The Z0 is around uh, 10 perm EV. Um, the X is slightly less than, or sorry, slightly greater than 1. C is also slightly greater than 1. Um, we found that, at least for California, initially the decision temperature is a little bit less, um, so the CS has been less than 1. Um, but we've, we're working on adjusting those. Yes? Why did, the, if, why did the neutrons get emitted first and then the photons? You said why that happens? Yes. Yeah. Why can't the photons get emitted first? That's why it's like Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They, they remove more energy at once. Yeah, I think more, that's more energy is available. Yeah. Well, it, I mean, they, yeah. they have the bigger space space right yeah. then, and you, you you get rid of more energy faster by neutron. Yeah. Right. But there's all, put one, say, the first strong interaction, then electromagnetic interaction, and then final electromagnetic interaction, and so some kind of time scale. Yeah, that's yeah. another way of looking yeah. at it. That, that, that's the thing. Because after all of this, there's also weak interaction of the parts, uh, generally speaking, the things are unstable. Yeah, that's, that's, that's the delayed emission, where you also you can have, by beta, by beta emission, you can have um, you can get neutrinos, um, photons, um, These are significant reactions in general, the neutron emission, if it's, ener if it's energetically level. Charged particles first, then right. neutrons, then photons. And charged particles usually aren't. Not here, um, not here, not here. For, for these energies, they're not important. Um, okay, so some of the results that I can show for just a couple of different energies. Um, this is prompt fission neutron spectrum from Freya for plutonium-239 um, and uranium-235 at around half an MeV and then at 14 MeV. And you see this pre-equilibrium bump, um, mostly for first chance fission, and then as you emit more neutrons, that bump gets lower. So that's a 14 MeV. Um, you don't see any kind of bump like that for um, half a MeV because it's, the energy is too low. And what you generally see is that the first couple of neutrons, um, at least with, for these lower energies, have a slightly harder distribution at, at higher outgoing neutron energies. And then as you go to larger and larger neutron multiplicities, it tends to get um, a little bit less. So the neutron multiplicity distribution um, compared to, to data, these are without making any adjustments to this width parameter, the C that I mentioned. And um, it's, it's pretty good. It's rather close. Shape is good. Um, if we adjust C up to about, say, 1.1 or so for this, then it gets much better. Um, but as you go to higher energies, you have a larger number of neutrons emitted, and so the neutron multiplicity distribution moves to the right. Okay, so I'll do some quick model comparisons. Um, there are other Monte Carlo fission codes on the market. Uh, we're working with the Los Alamos group, on, um, and they have a code called CGMF. Um, there's a French code called Fieferlin, and then there's the Jeff code, and CMS and CGMF, sorry, and Fuchelin are based on hauser kreshbach theory, so they include all the um, angular momentum and spin and parity, um, which is actually fairly slow, so they're much slower um, for event than, than by, I mean, by orders of magnitude. Um, but all three of our codes use similar inputs of yields and total kinetic energy to extract the excitation energy and emit neutrons and so on. Um, Jeff is different. Um, it's really modeling the potential energy surface, so it's trying to do a very good job of getting the yields systematically, and then they have a model, systematic model for the excitation energy. Um, and they have parameters with V and A. And they can do many, many isotopes very fast. Um, I don't actually know how they do the neutron and proton emission in Jeff because it's a statistical model. And this is all they say. Um, it doesn't require the total kinetic energy as an input. It's more of an output. Um, but there are 
many parameters in that. Yes. Yes. Um, okay. So um, this is a side by side comparison of CGMF and, and prior to the same. Um, for the same isotope, and they have two different modes. One is that they fix this RT parameter, and one is that they mer uh, vary it as a function of A. And if they fix it, then we get very, very similar results. If they fit it, and they model it as a function of A, then it looks somewhat better compared to the data. And you can see similar results between Fryad and Spikerlin, and then, um, and then there's gas over there. Um, you can do the same kind of comparison for the neutron multiplicity distribution, and neutron kinetic energy as a function of mass. Um, so since I'm running out of time and running out of people, I guess I'll have to respond. Um, so I want to say a, a little bit about correlated observables and um, possible applications. So um, there are neutron-neutron angular correlations that have been measured by a, a number of groups. And they're, they really reflect the, um, the emitter source in a, in a quite a reasonable way, not only because they, they change shape with different isotopes, but they can also depend on, on the energy of the neutron, the minimum energy of the neutron. Um, so you can make these measurements of the correlation yield as a function of the relative angle between the two neutrons. And this is a kind of general shape um, that, you can com that you can break down into different sources. So if you have um, two neutrons emitted, and one comes from one fire and one comes from the other fire, because of the boost, then, then you get a back-to-back -back correlation. And um, that's in the blue on the right. Um, and if you have both of them emitted from either the light fragment or the heavy fragment, then you see a peak at zero degrees, and the peak is, is higher for the, for the light fragment because it's a higher velocity. Um, so when you sum all the possibilities together, you get the curve with the open circles over here. And you can look at these um, for different um, initial energies and um, of, the, of the neutrons, and this is basically near, near thermal, a little bit above thermal. And you can see that it's a fairly um, characteristic shape with a slightly higher peak at uh, 180 degrees. And when you go to a, say, a higher energy uh, neutron coming in, then you get the, the correlation yield to be more or less washed out. And that's because um, you don't, you know, if you have some emitter number, I mean, number of emitted neutrons close to two, then you're going to have, you're going to get both neutrons for the correlation. If you have a third neutron involved or more, then you may not get, say, the first two neutrons. You may get the first neutron and the last neutron, or they, or they, uh, you know, it's just harder to tell which, which fragment they're coming from, even though they're boosted, and, and so the yield um, correlation gets, gets washed out and gets flatter. Um, we can look at it, this correlation as a function of um, the uh, inputs, and basically the only thing that really changes the shape of the correlation is how much energy we give to the light fragment relative to the heavy one. If you give it less energy, um, you can completely change the shape of the correlation and tilt it in a different way entirely. Um, and and so there are there's uh, one measurement that was done by a colleague of ours at, at Livermore, Jerome Rebeck, uh, who also works with me on, on the transport model of Freya. And, yeah. um, and his, he has data on plutonium, spontaneous fission of plutonium 240. And he realized that he needed to, to adjust X to get a better agreement with his data. But there is no um, sawtooth measurement for plutonium 240 spontaneous fission. So you can learn about um, that kind of emission by, by looking at, at this kind of measurement. So that's another way of trying to 
to get a better handle on, on the uh, input parameters that we need for a model. Um, but if you're looking at data here, you can see by, by changing x, you can really change the shape of the sawtooth, and, but it doesn't affect any other observables significantly. Um, you can change the, the shape of the uh, neutron multiplicity distribution very much by changing the C parameter. You get a much stronger peak if you assume that it's less than one, and you broaden out that distribution if it's bigger than one. Um, so we have relatively good comparison to, to data. Um, we also have very good comparison of the data um, with neutron and light fragment correlation. Um, so, to summarize, uh, there's a renaissance in fission phenomenology that's really application driven. I mean, we've been working with nonproliferation for the last six years, and we have three more, we got another grant for three more years um, to, to develop this event by event treatment and incorporate it into transport codes um, in MCNT6 specifically. And Freya broke some kind of barrier by being the first published uh, fission code from my and my Carlo. And uh, it's available online. And um, we have 1.0 is public. Um, and FIA 2.0 was released last year. And these are some of the plots that Jerome made for the, uh, for the published version. So um, with that, if there are any more questions, and thank you very much for inviting me. So you've made it public. Are there people running out and using it now? Yes. So you have a number of hits or likes or whatever. I mean, I, I, have, a, <laughs> I, have, I have no idea if anybody likes Friar. We have no, we have no dislikes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we've gotten questions from people that I didn't even know um, knew about you know, or I've never heard of. So it's not just the, our little community that, that I know of that people are using it, but there are people who, who are using it um, all over. So I did think of something to tell you about the competition between photon and neutron, just to mention this. Really what you should think of it is that photon emission is rate limited. There is basically a maximum radiative capability of having a charge that's about a few femtometers across. That's really what limits that rate. And that, that, I think of it more as like the limitation of photons and neutrons just win in this more energy because it's kind of slow, right? The giant type of residence is a few MEDY that's your time scale, so. Yeah, so like we, we do spontaneous vision, we do um, photon emission, and we do
which got very excited about this, and they were trying to, uh, you know, see if we can somehow or other squeeze some Canadian audience out of that approach by, by improving it. So, so we are working on it. It, it may not be in time for the life cycle plan, because it's a new graduate student they're talking about, right? Yeah. There's a statement here, just to be clear, about what we've been talking about all this time, is the modeling of what basically powers this entire field. Right? <laughs> I mean, I'd really want to have that kind of sit and, and, and be thought of that. Right? We really, do, we're, we're just trying to come up with a physics-based phenomenological model here that reproduces all of the observables. It, it's not easy, but it's amazing how far you can get with a few simple parameters mm -hmm. and energy and momentum concentration. So now we're on an event by event basis, at least this conserves energy. Uh, is, does this, can this model be uh, used for ternary fission? Uh, um. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Don't go it's okay. <laughs> Scission neutrons. People know what that is. Yeah. There are neutrons that are emitted directly during scission. Yeah. 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 Some, 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 some people are very high on those. I mean, I have met others who claim that all neutrons come from scission. And, and, and none from the fragments. Well, nobody made it except them, of course. But, uh, <laughs> but, there, is, but there is a small and enthusiastic group of people who are very high on those. Similarly with That's the term. Some people are very high on that. It does happen. 